All right, so up to this point, we've been dabbling with some HTML. Uh, I've had these different versions of the project that have been evolving like that, and now I've even got a picture right there. Now the picture's a little too big, so if I had my monitor, my, my web browser size a little like this, it's kind of getting big. And it was smaller when I had it on my website. So we can introduce a little touch of CSS at this point because we've got a lot of the building the building blocks of what this uh, of what of what HTML is the content the structure of things next is CSS actually we'll do one more thing then we'll do CSS I would like to put a link back to my website where I got this picture from so looking at our code there's a paragraph which displays the picture and below the image I want to have a link here back to my website well below the image I want to add a break and then write the text visit VMC Inc website Uh, what does the break do again? <coughs> Next line. Starts a new line. It breaks the line. Now, previously I wrote it on the line above. Now I'm writing it on the line below. There's no difference. I just wrote it right here because you can see it. But it would have been fine if I put it at the very end. Wherever it is at, the web browser it's going to basically process the code from top to bottom, left to right. So the web browser is going to get to the line where the image appears, left to right, show the image, then break, next line, text. So I could have done it that way on the, on the end of the line of the image, or, as we're about to do, at the beginning of the line of the rest of the text. doesn't matter. It will be processed either way. What I want here then is to have the name of my website here be an active link. I want to be able to click VMC Inc that it goes to my website. This again, HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. I want to mark from here to here is something. I want to mark that when you click on my website's name, it goes to my site. So we're going to use the tag that creates links, which is one of the ones that is named very odd for beginners. The A tag. A tag creates a link. You can note that a tag for links anchor text is what I believe it is technically known as behind the scenes <coughs> anchor text this is our anchor that will take us elsewhere this is where our link is at I'm gonna click here it'll go elsewhere so it's not the link tag it's the a tag and a lot of these tags make sense some of them are spelled out some of them are short it's just again about the memorization. P for paragraph, IMG for image, although it could have been so easily been two more letters to be image instead of IMG. And A, I like to think about it as active link, but I think it's anchor text, technically what it is. Well, this seems incomplete. How does it know where I need to go? It needs an attribute. Just like I had image tag needed an attribute to be complete, I need an attribute for a tag. A tag for links needs href attribute. So now inside of the a tag, make sure you've got a and then slash a. It's marked properly. Inside the A tag, we need an attribute, so there's a space there. <coughs> href equals quote, end quote. I'm seeing attributes are marked as red, so don't think red means it's the code is wrong. It's just that it marks attributes as red. Uh, regular tags as blue, links, purple, comments, green. You don't have to memorize the colors at all, don't worry. But the different colors mean different things. 
And so I'm saying href, hypertext reference. Very, very fancy way of saying a link, a web address, a URL. So now inside of the href quotes, you put an address, a complete address, http colon slash slash vmcink.net. You could put the www part of it if you really wanted. This should work without it. But what it definitely needs is the HTTP part. If an external link, which is a link to someone else's site, if an external link is used, you must have HTTP <coughs> colon slash slash. That tells it, go to the web, go to the internet, and connect with via hypertext transfer protocol. HTTP and go to this website. If it doesn't have the HTTP, it'll think it's a file on your in your folder. It'll think there's a file in this folder called vmcinc.net. That's not right. It has to have the HTTP part of it so that it knows to go to the web. Save it and run it, and you should see that the text VMC Inc. is underlined like a link. You put your mouse on it, it looks like a link. You click on it, it should go like a link. <coughs> so I marked from here to here a link. Looks like a link. If you then If you then uh, hover your mouse over it, depending on the web browser, it'll also probably tell you where you're about to go. If it doesn't tell you, don't worry. But then if you click on it, it goes back to my website. Or it should go back to my website. And that's the final part of HTML, hypertext markup language. <coughs> so the L is language. It's a programming language. The M is markup. We're marking from here to here, do something. And HT is hypertext, which is the word chosen to mean a link from one document to another, HTML. Yes? To a new tab, good point. Do you notice that when you click, it stays in the same window and usually we see that when we click a link it should open in a new tab well we need another attribute we have an attribute that says where are we going we need another attribute to tell it to open in a new window or a new tab so we'll add another attribute here inside of I'm still inside of the a tag space here's a new attribute target Yes, there is a target attribute, but no, there's not a Walmart attribute. Target. And what we're doing here then is underscore blank. This is the underscore symbol, shift dash. That will then have it, that will then have this link be opened in a target of a blank window or tab. Depends on the browser. Some of them open in a tab, some of them op open in a window. We can fully control that later via JavaScript. But here, this creates a basic link that opens in its own tab with the attribute target blank. So all of this is HTML, and we're writing the, the, the code that was invented in about 1989. <coughs> so websites like Facebook and Twitter and your bank and all of that. Websites, they've been around since about 1989. That's about to be 30 years. Now the web and the internet are technically different. The internet has been around since the 60s. The web, websites, have been around for just about 30 years. They were invented, the, the language of websites was invented in about 1989 by a student in a university in, 
in, uh, in Europe. Tim Berners-Lee invented this. He thought, well, what if there was a way for me to link one of my boring research documents with another equally boring research document? What if there was a way to make a language to link from one computer document to another computer document? And there had been versions of it before. But this person thought of this protocol, this language, HTML, submitted it to his instructor, and he said, that sounds interesting, and they released it out to the wild, and other people thought, that's really interesting. Well, what if it does this? What if it does that? <coughs> and it grew, and it grew, and now this is a global invention. This is an invention that has changed the world. Literally, what we're doing here is a code, is an invention that has changed the world. We chat with friends and family on websites. We do our online banking on websites. We buy products on websites. And nothing like this, the World Wide Web, really existed before 1989. There were things like CompuServe and Prodigy and such, but this was a different sort of system based on this very simple to learn programming language. To program something like AOL, that's complex. CompuServe, Prodigy, and all of that. But to program websites, uh, if you've never done any programming in, in HTML to make a website, look at how far we've come in this amount of time. You're, you're making a website. You've got text, you've got pictures, you've got links. This was revolutionary in 1989. And this changed the world. And I think it's really fascinating for the person that invented it, Tim Berners-Lee. He didn't copyright it, he didn't patent it, he didn't lock it down. He gave it away free to the world. And it has changed the world communication instantly all over the world <coughs> anyone can make a website now he's doing well for himself he's been knighted by the Queen of England and he's got a mansion and all of that so he's fine he gave away his invention for free but he's doing fine and what that means for us is using this language we can shape it as the course goes on to make apps this plus CSS plus JavaScript we will use to make apps right now it's a basic website but as we learn more of these languages, we can make it into real apps. A real app that then accesses the camera of a device. Vibration, GPS, contacts, text messaging, databases. And we'll get to that in the three months that we're here. This project right now looks a little boring, so let's add a little CSS to make it less boring. Question. Yes. What was the difference between the previous versions? The syntax <laughs> of the older languages was written a little different. The older language, the older version, for example, was all in capital letters. And we're writing here in lowercase. That's one thing. The syntax and the appropriate attributes were different. Different tags are added to the language as time goes on. Now, recently, we have a tag for video. We didn't have a tag for video in the old days. We have a tag for image, or we have a tag for video. So as the language evolves, it gets more features. The syntax evolves, and what you can do evolves. So we're covering the latest version from day one. Let's uh, change this up a little bit. The default of our project is white background, black text. That's how it's always been. This is the default. It doesn't, it doesn't know any better, so it says black on white. OK. In the old days, the very first websites, actually, they were black text on a gray background. If you remember in the old days, mosaic and such, they, they were gray backgrounds. Now it's black text, white background. Via CSS, we can then change colors and sizes alignment, create columns, and all of that. So we'll do it very simple as an introduction to CSS. We're going to write some CSS. Very, very, very simple. It's back up to line 6. Let's back up to where you've got your body tag. The default body tag has a specific background color and text color. We're going to change that to specify our own background and text color. Inside of the body tag, we will add an attribute, style attribute.
inline CSS as a style attribute. Style equals quotes, that's CSS. What's going to be inside the quotes then are the are the are the codes of CSS. We've written various codes of HTML. Head code, title code, body code, head tag, title tag, body tag. We've written various codes of HTML. There's and there's like 200. Let's just pick a number. There's 200 HTML codes. You don't have to have them all memorized. You know, you might be able to get by with 10, 15, 20, who knows? You don't need to have all of the HTML code memorized, although it's very impressive to show off to people. <coughs> CSS has its own 200 codes that you could memorize, but you don't have to. <coughs> you just need to know the ones that are important for your project, and you need to know to look up the ones that are necessary for you. And again, it's impressive to know the right code to make a drop shadow, but you don't need to know it. The idea, though, is that we are going to write CSS in line to the body as an attribute. There are other kinds of CSS and I'll just note them right here, but we'll get back to them later. We've also got embedded. How do you spell embedded? Embedded. Two Ds. Embedded. Embedded, and we've also got external. We'll come back to what those are in a moment. We'll just keep with inline for the moment. So within the quotes here, we, we write CSS code and it has its own syntax. Syntax is the way you write something. English has a syntax. Japanese has a syntax. Spanish has a syntax. Right in Japanese in, in Spanish or in English you write the cat is black. In Spanish you know I might write el gato negro. No, in Japanese you might write you might write it in you know neko shiroi. No, that's white. But right, you write it in a different way in the different languages, right? That's the syntax in the different languages. The language of CSS is written in this way. Background, dash <coughs> color, colon, red, semicolon. It's very different than HTML. HTML, angle brackets, opening and closing angle brackets, CSS, is a different sort of way. CSS syntax is property colon value semicolon. Obviously it's very important to have the right symbols here. There's some property with a colon space, some value with a semicolon. Save it and run it and see what you get. Notice it's all lowercase. There's a dash between background and color. When you save it and run it, you should get a, a great eye-piercing shade of red. Red background color. <coughs> what other colors exist? Blue, pink. Purple, gold. There's gold. It doesn't really look like it's shining, but there's gold. But the syntax is some property, some value. Question? If there's one in every bed if you're putting on the style sheet, or is it just doing HTML? Well, that's the one I haven't talked about yet external. Short answer is yes. Long answer is we'll get there. Yes? You can also use a, a number value, right? That's right. So right now, I'm writing it very simply in terms of a named color. Uh, let's say I, I had blue. My company's color of blue is not that color. I need a specific color formula. So <coughs> we'll get to this deeper later, but we can also write colors in this format. Instead of a named color, because have you tried writing a color here? Um, 
you know, that doesn't work? Neon. It's not really like color, but if you try to write a color that doesn't work, it ignores it. There's only about, I think, 114 colors that are named. Well, there are more than 114 colors that exist, and I need a certain shade of blue. So we have a way to write colors also via a formula. If you write RGB, parentheses. Now here I can mix a color with red, green, and blue units. Red, green, and blue paints. You know, like finger painting. I'm going to put a little bit of red, a little bit of blue, I get purple. So with RGB, red, green, blue, I'm going to say 105 units of red, comma, 50 units of green. Now I'll do 5 units of green, comma, 50 units of blue in this order. Red, green, blue. Red, comma, green, comma, blue. Then I get a purple shade of color. If I increase blue to 150, I get that shade. And the maximum is 255, from 0 to 255. So here we can create how many colors? Like 16 million colors this way. Because we can go from 0 to 255 times 0 to 255 times 0 to 255. 255 cubed is like 16 million or something. And we're just playing here with colors. Color, background color. property can have various color <coughs> scheme values named color so red purple we have magenta we have really weird ones we have uh, Alice blue we have um, I think there's one called bisque. What's bisque? It's a soup. There's a color bisque. We have uh, fuchsia. I think that's how you spell it. So we have named colors. We have also RGB color. Mixing red. Uh, red plus green, plus blue light, technically, uh, 0 to 255. We also have hex color, which is in a format that looks something like this. Uh, 2, 2, <coughs> BB, 88. I'll come back to this one. This one's uh, kind of complicated. Uh, and I've been working in web design and app design since about 2001. It's 15 years. And even I don't think in, in hex colors. Complicated. So we'll, we'll get into this, of course, more as time goes on. But let's say. I set a background color. So I have a property, and I set its value. I have a property to affect the text color. So I list one CSS property, semicolon, and then I can list more CSS properties. So after that semicolon, but still inside the quotes. If I have background color, then it would make perfect sense to have text color. It would make too much sense, because that's not correct. When they were inventing this, CSS was invented in about 1996, and other people invented it. 
uh, HTML, 1989, CSS, 1996. Um, no one had the great idea to call this text color. They called it color. Color means text color. But the syntax is the same. Some sort of property, colon, space, value, semicolon. So these semicolons are sort of like do this, and then do this, and then do the following. You should always have the ending semicolon even if it's the last property. So now here I'm affecting the default body tag was white background, black text. White <coughs> background color, black color of text. And now here I've, I've overridden it to be what I want. So what we're doing right now is creating inline CSS. Very briefly, CSS added directly to a tag. Not the best way. To show it and the concept and what CSS is, is a great way as a learning tool, but it's not the best way to do this correctly or professionally. These other two listed here are better. And actually, in the order that I've got them listed are the best. Embedded. All code consolidated at the in the head block of the document. This is the second best way to do it. We'll do this way in a moment. And then the best way, all code consolidated in its own CSS file. <coughs> the best way. So just to learn this, we did it the worst way. But the idea still is the same, that we've got a property and a value. It's worst because we've added the attribute directly to the tag. So that means, well, I want to change the color of those paragraphs. I've got two paragraphs, so I'd have to go into each paragraph and add style. Even though I want them both <coughs> to be yellow background, red text color, I'd have to go to each one of the P's down here, and to each one of the P's add style. Well, that's not so bad when I've got two paragraphs. But what if I've got a more complex project with 20 paragraphs? I don't want to add style to each individual element. So that's when the next two are better. Let's do embedded. That is that we write all of the CSS code in one central place, and it applies automatically everywhere that we tell it. Let's say after the, after my comment here about CSS, um, actually not there, uh, before the end of head, so up there, as I said here, um, in the head block. So before the end of head, we have style, tag, so we have a tag of HTML that says what's inside is CSS. And this is its own sort of little world. So what I write in here should be in the syntax of CSS. And because we are in this little world of CSS, even the syntax for our comment <coughs> is a little different. Now, slash, asterisk, asterisk slash, this is a CSS comment. This doesn't apply anymore. We're inside of the world of CSS here. Therefore, an HTML comment won't work. The HTML comment doesn't work. It's the same sort of idea that I start the comment slash asterisk and then end it 
and anything in between, this is all commented. Yes? It doesn't change color? No, because right now our, our document, if, if you notice under language, our document is set to HTML. So it's only paying attention to see HTML. But if we change our language to CSS, it'll focus on CSS. So don't worry about this, but that's a good point. The color doesn't change because our main document is HTML. <coughs> so inside of the style block, we also have to be a little more specific. With inline CSS, I attached it directly to a tag via style. I want to attach CSS to both of these paragraphs. So our syntax inside of the CSS block, selector, curly braces, property, colon, value, semicolon. What am I selecting? What am I targeting? How am I affecting it? So we've seen this already, some sort of property colon value. Now we've got curly braces, which is, which is right next to the P tag. And we've got a selector. We need to select what are we affecting, what are we targeting. P, not with the angle brackets. I'm not writing HTML code. I'm writing CSS code. I'm selecting P tags, curly brace, space curly brace. I would recommend to write the pair before you forget. When I teach coding, I always recommend people to open and close their pairs. Right? If we had, you know, SRC equals quote, and you write something and you forget to close your quote, it's broken. I recommend whenever you're writing any pairs of anything, quotes, open quote, end quote, and then your details. So with P, open quote, don't write what's next because you're going to forget the closing curly brace, perhaps. Open and close curly brace. When I had RGB, I wrote the pair. RGB parentheses, and then the detail. So anyway, for us, P, curly braces, and then it's the same as what we've seen before. Background, dash, color, colon, space, yellow, semicolon, text color. Um, Let's try red. So what this is supposed to say is we are selecting <coughs> wherever there are any paragraphs in the body. We are affecting its background color property with a yellow value and a text color property with a red value. No, no, the, the heading of H1, 2, and 3 and such, that's what I said earlier about the right tag for the right task. So there is a tag that specifies headings, they're, they're hierarchy, but there's no default way to number our paragraphs. We could do it sort of like workarounds, but the default is no, every paragraph is a paragraph, but there are ways to delineate certain paragraphs for certain things with classes or IDs. We'll get to that later. So let's see here. Let's see if both of our paragraphs change. Because I'm saying select <coughs> any paragraphs that exist and change the background color and the text color. There's the paragraph where I had my first text. Here's the paragraph where I also had a picture plus text. Background color yellow, text color red. If 
to have my screen maximized like that. It looks really weird. It goes all the way across the screen. Well, that's because I never specified how wide to display the color. This is again showing computers are dumb. They don't know what we want. I had something in my mind, exactly what I thought, and then it didn't appear like that. I wanted the color to only be as long as the amount of text that I had. I never specified it, so it didn't do it. I wanted the, the text color here to only appear on the text over here, not behind the picture. I didn't specify it, so it didn't do it. And we're going to see this over and over, and even worse, when we get to JavaScript, because that's when we really see how not intelligent computers are. Computers are smart and all of that, and one day we fear Skynet and Terminators taking over because we program them to be smart, but if we don't program them, they, <coughs> they don't know anything and they don't do what we expect. But at the very least, what I did was it showed background color yellow. Yeah. We're going to play devil's advocate. We did a, the embedded version mm -hmm. of a paragraph, and we did the inline version. So this gets into why CSS is the second most complex of things. Because what if you we, we embedded and we did inline, is the question, right? Well, now there might be a conflict. Uh, one is trying to do one thing, and one is trying to do another. So here's where we might give it a shot. Here I'm saying, make it yellow and red. And I say, OK, well, what if instead I add inline style, background color, pink. You don't have to do this, but let me see what it looks like. Hmm, it's pink. Well, this is the part of what I said about the complexity of CSS, in that now there's a conflict. One thing is saying one thing, and one thing is saying another thing. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. <coughs> cascading Style Sheets, CSS. Cas sheets is often to delineate the external file. Style, of course, is how I'm affecting it. And cascading means, well, what, what cascades in the real world? Maybe you know it in Spanish, cascada, cascade. Waterfall. A waterfall cascades, falls from top to bottom, right? CSS is like that. It said at the top, make my paragraphs yellow. So that cascaded throughout my document. All paragraphs are yellow. But then I said later on, make this paragraph pink. So it became pink. But this pink does not cascade to the next paragraph. Why? Again, we'll get to that in detail when we talk about CSS in detail. That's why it's the second hardest of them, because there's a lot of details. Child elements, parent elements, sibling elements, the specificity of things, it's complex. That's why it's the second complex one. So the short answer is basically it does it in an order from top to bottom. At the very top in the head, I said paragraphs are yellow. Then later I said, actually, this paragraph is pink. So it did it. And then the next paragraph continues the original programming, so it goes back to yellow. back for the moment. <coughs> Just getting style sheets. Basically, CSS is processed from top to bottom and then altered with specificity. Specificity. I'm being more specific later. I might set global styles and then as apply specifically later. That's the newest one, sure. So we did red right here. We could do that as RGB, which would be. 25500 brand new 
in CSS3 is RGBA, where we can specify an alpha, which is transparency, a fourth value to say 50% visible. <coughs> Here now, it's full red, no green, no blue, but then 0 0.5 or 50% alpha, 50% transparent. So the red is going to be like a weaker red, because I'm seeing the color behind it. So there's lots of things to cover, of course. As I said, in this three-month class, we could do three months only on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and never touch the stuff about apps, or databases, or publishing it to the app stores. So in part one of the class, we're going to cover as much as we can of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in the purpose of getting to the app, the basic app structure. In part two, we take that basic app structure of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and upgrade it to be an app, Android, iPhone, iPad, Windows, whatever. Part three, we add the advanced things, databases, etc., and publish it. So that's the big idea of all of these three classes. And of course, we're not going to be able to cover everything. And that's why the IMCP program, the feud program, checking the website links that I have on the syllabus, checking those books, learning on your own, there's always something new to learn. But this is what we've got here so far. We can get much more complex, of course. Like I said, I want to resize that picture. I want to resize this picture. We have enough of the knowledge to start to get <coughs> us there. Uh, we could create some inline CSS or some embedded CSS. We won't do external just yet. It takes too much work at the moment. We will do external later. But external is basically that we would be writing all of our CSS code in its own file mystyles.css and then link that file to our HTML. We'll get to that later. But we have some of the knowledge right now based on what we've got here via style. I want to try to control the size of my image. Based on this one little line of syntax, do you think we might be able to do it? How do you think we might affect an image in our HTML body area? IMG curly braces. That's enough, perhaps, of what we know. That's fine. Yeah, we're going to affect an image somehow. So then I need to know what's the property, what's the value. Well, at least this one's easy. I want to change the width and the height of an image. Do you think there's a way to change a width and a height? Yeah. Width, colon, and then a value. Let's start off with. Um, we'll say 100 px <coughs> semicolon if there's a width there's probably a height colon space will do 200 px px are pixels are the dots that make up the screen if you zoom in every screen is made out of dots see this There, you can see the dots right there. There's three pixels that make up the dot of the eye. So px are pixels. No space between these, the unit, no space between the value and the unit. Go ahead and save it and run it and see what happens. We're saying any images, any images that exist in the HTML block. Let's affect the width property and the height property by setting a value of 100 pixels by 200 pixels. What do you get? <coughs> a stretched out cat. So I made that picture. I don't know what it was originally, but now I made it 100 pixels wide and 200 pixels tall. And of course, we can choose any values from 0 to infinity. You know, what if you do, do this? 
right here, you make it over 9,000. That'll work, it'll be really, 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 really big. Don't, don't try it actually, but it'll work. We've also got other units, however. What do you think this means? One inch. So we can use real world units as well. One inch by one inch. The problem with using real world measurements, however, is that they don't work in a digital world. Obviously, this pencil is exactly, I don't know, five inches. But if I say that's one inch, this on my projector <coughs> is obviously bigger than one inch. It's bigger than my hand. And on my screen here, it's also bigger than one inch. But on a mobile device, it might be one inch. So instead of uh, using uh, units like this, we can also use elastic units or variable units. What about if we do 75%? By 25%. This one is variable, and it depends on the size of your screen. If I resize my web browser, you should see the picture growing and shrinking. When I've got a maximized screen, it's 75% of the size of the screen. When it's a smaller screen, it's still 75%, but smaller. <coughs> so watch this. I'm stretching out my screen, and the picture gets bigger, but always stays 75%. If I stretch it taller, it's a little less obvious. My screen's too small to really show it, my projector. But definitely the width. But here we're seeing the syntax of CSS, and we're seeing its purpose to affect the design of things. We've affected a couple of colors sizes of things. That's a big discussion. That's a, a big topic of CSS. It's the second hardest one. There's 200 more codes to learn. How do I make a drop shadow? There's a property for that. How do I uh, line three columns? There's a property for that. Uh, how do I set the uh, a, a cool border line, a dotted line around a picture? There's a property for that. Um, just like how there's a tag for the right task in HTML, there's a property of CSS for the right purpose. There's a property for a purpose, <coughs> there's a tag for a task. We'll do one more thing. This is the tip of the iceberg, but we will do a little JavaScript. I'm going to do a little bit of JavaScript to see how that one differs compared to CSS, compares to HTML. CSS can be the same thing in that I can write inline, I'm sorry, JavaScript can be the same in that I can write inline JavaScript, I can write embedded JavaScript, I can write external JavaScript. Just like I have them in order here, inline JavaScript is worst. Embedded JavaScript is OK, and external JavaScript is the best. We're not going to do external just yet. We're going to do embedded. So usually, it's going to work best if you write embedded JavaScript before the end of body. We'll go into the details why later. So before the end of your document, before the end of body, let's write a comment. Embedded JavaScript below, often best to write it before the end of body, so that all elements or all nodes render properly. Jargon. We'll we'll cover what this means later. Render. If we've got a style tag that creates a little world of CSS, 
we also have a JavaScript tag that creates a little world of JavaScript. It's script. So what follows in here will be JavaScript. And this is the same sort of comment here. Now the code does change color here. This is a JS comment, <coughs> like the CSS comment. So it, it doesn't have its own separate kind of multi-line comment. But it does have another kind of comment that may be useful. Double slash, a single line comment. Only this line is a comment. This one is not. And that's invalid JavaScript. It'll cause errors. So slash asterisk creates the multi-line comment as before. But sometimes it's useful to add a double slash at the beginning of a line. And then what follows, actually now it is, and what follows is, is then a, a single line comment. Because I could have something like do something, <coughs> double slash this, JavaScript did something. Don't write this. But this is another reason to use the single line. I have it write some valid JavaScript, and then I, I comment it that way. Above, below, to the side of it. Multi-line comment, single line comment. You need the double slash at the beginning of each line for it to be multi-line. Again, this is not a comment. This is a comment. JavaScript itself has its own syntax. JavaScript syntax object dot method or object dot property. There are two that we can start off with. There's other ones. Again, it's more complex. There's some kind of object, dot, method, parentheses, semicolon, or object, dot, property, no parentheses, semicolon. We'll get into that later. This is, this is the third one. This is the most complex ones. Honestly, CSS and JavaScript together, easy. JavaScript, hard. I recommend this book. I, I'll check if I put it in the syllabus, but there's this book that I really like. Um, it's a 500 page book 500 page book on HTML and CSS then there's a companion book that's 600 pages just on JavaScript so I'll put those in the in the notes later but that's how complex it is with one 500 page book you can cover all that you need about HTML and CSS but then you need one 600 page book to cover all that you need about just JavaScript but JavaScript is, inter is the interactivity Here's an example. Window dot alert. There's an object, and we'll talk about objects later. JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language. I don't have time to get into what that means just right now, but we will. There's an object called window. There's a method called alert. It's basically do something upon something. Inside the parentheses here, quotes, let's say, hello world. So again, the syntax, some kind of object, dot, some kind of method or property, semicolon. Quotes, 
for some sort of message. Go ahead and save it and run it, see what you get. I'm in Firefox, and what I get is a pop up that looks like that. If I'm in Chrome, I get a pop up that looks like that. If I if I'm in Internet Explorer, I get a pop-up that looks like that. So every of the three browsers I showed here interpreted the JavaScript slightly differently and even interpreted the HTML and CSS slightly differently. HTML and CSS and JavaScript are all common languages with a, with a certain um, uh, specification. But then the browsers choose to interpret them in their own slightly different way. <coughs> so like English, American English, British English, South African English, they're all English, but they're all different. Australian English, and then across the water, New Zealand English, they're all different. Spanish, no, Spain Spanish, different than Mexican Spanish different than Colombian Spanish. So they're all, you know, a root language, but then they're dialects. So each browser sort of interprets the language slightly different with its own drawl, its own dialect. And you saw that very obviously with these JavaScript pop-ups. Internet Explorer is a little window that I can move. Firefox, I can't move it and it pops up right in the middle, fades everything out. And Chrome, it fades in at the top. But they're all doing the same thing. They're making a simple pop-up that says the message and then an OK. This is JavaScript. <coughs> Let's do something else. Let's comment out that code. Comments are also useful for deactivating code. I want to do something else, but I don't want to delete that. I can comment out the code. And commenting code works in JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. I can put the double slash to comment out only that line, or I can put the multi-line, which takes more effort. Instead, let's do window.prompt. <coughs> In quotes, enter your username. Save it and run it and see what happens. Window object dot prompt method with a parameter is it parameter or argument it is parameter no, it's argument one of the two <coughs> with the enter your username argument and what happens is you get another kind of pop-up but it's asking for your username it's got a little box it's got <coughs> an okay and a cancel I put my username Click OK. Nothing happens because all I told it to do was make a pop up asking for the name. I didn't say to store it. I didn't say to display it on screen. I didn't say to do anything with it. And again, the computer doesn't know what I want. I had an idea. I wanted it to display on screen, but I didn't finish programming that. So, Let's enhance this a little bit more. Before the before the start of this line, <coughs> let's let's write var my name equals the rest. This is an object that's built in the window object. I am then creating a new object right here, a variable. A variable is a container an empty container that I can fill with whatever I want. 
just like this container is full of markers and pens, and, and now I have a stapler inside. It's just a container. It's an object. It holds something. VAR creates a variable. I name it whatever I want. Notice the spelling here. I'll talk about spelling later. My name equals. I'm assigning the result of the prompt method. Before, it asked for my name, and then that data just went somewhere, nowhere. It disappeared. I didn't do anything with the data. But now I'm saying, ask for the name, assign the value of what they typed to the object, to the variable, my name. Then, document.write my name. So cool, it's going to ask me for my name and it's going to put it on screen <coughs> into the document. We're going to write my name. Cool, it'll, it'll be like, welcome, Victor. Go ahead and save it and run it. Make sure that my name there is written the same way both times. Sin uh, capitalization in JavaScript really, really matters. In HTML, it doesn't. In CSS, it matters. In JavaScript, it really matters. But however you capitalize these things, keep them consistent. We've been writing everything so far in lowercase. And this should still work if I call it like this, lowercase. But as we get more complex, especially JavaScript, it's very common to put capital letters in the middle of the word for readability. Both of these should work. But it's a little easier to read this. It looks like two words. I don't want to put a space. That's not correct. And I don't want to have this lowercase and this uppercase. That's not correct. Let's see. So I'll run my latest code. It pops up. Type my name. <coughs> Click OK. There's my name. It didn't appear where I thought. It looks small, it doesn't look centered, it's no, it doesn't have any special color, because again, I didn't program it enough to really do more than the basics. We can note here, create an object, a variable, and fill it assign to it and fill it with the result of the prompt method attached to browser window. Then to the HTML document object Use the write method to display the contents of the object on screen. So object-oriented programming languages are languages that focus on objects. That sounds like circular logic and that's what we're doing we've got an object of the web browser window we've got an object of the HTML document we have various methods which are actual commands that we do so with the result of the prompt method right, methods are the actual commands sort of <clears throat> the prompt method um, has is built in. It, it pops up. It's got a little box. You add your name. You click OK. Your name gets passed into the program. Nothing happened to it until we then assigned it to a brand new object, and then we eventually display the contents of our object onto the screen. And that is the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg of JavaScript. 
because what we'll be doing in this class, if you have a chance to download the example app CBDB over on Amazon, there's a system that a person logs in with a username and password. <coughs> it loads up their uh, their account with their comics that they saved. I can log out, someone else logs in, it's got their stuff. I took a photo of the comic, I wrote a note about the comment, that's all saved in my account. All of that happens because there's a lot of JavaScript doing that. Storing the data in the database, retrieving it, knowing who is logged in, who has logged out, storing the photo in the memory card, and all of that. So I'm going to say at least 75% of the class is us going to be writing JavaScript. The other is going to be writing HTML and CSS. And we're also going to cover an aspect that a lot of us are not that strong in, the graphics of it all. A lot of us perhaps are very comfortable or have a mind for programming and logic and such. But then we're also going to need to create an icon for our app. We're going to need to write, you know, uh, explanatory text. We're going to need to write a store listing that really sells our app. We're going to need to pick good color combinations. And then suddenly a lot of us can't do that. We're not, you know, we're not design savvy. We never needed to be. Well, you're going to need to be everything in this class. You're going to need to know the programming aspect and the design aspect and the sales, the salesmanship aspect of it. <coughs> the aspect of promoting your app. And we're going to cover it all. You don't have to be versed in it when you come in, but it helps if you took the other classes. You saw the example that some of those icons look really nice, and some of them not so nice. And that's OK. You're not going to be graded on the quality of your graphics. You're going to be graded mostly on the that your code works. It doesn't log in, it doesn't log in, C minus. If the icon looks terrible, that's nice, you tried but it's going to be more of the coding aspects of it because you can always you know paint you can always change the wallpaper in the in the room you can't rebuild the room the room is here and so the um, the coding of it in javascript will be more important so we covered a lot in day one. If you've never done any of this before, we've covered HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. If you have had experience in any of these languages, it might have been a little slow. Thank you for following along. <coughs> but as the class goes on, we will go faster. And again, we're not going to be covering you know, steps A, B, C, D. We're probably going to go steps A, D, H. You know, Not every single step. That's what the book is for. That's what online resources is for. We're going to be covering enough of what is necessary for us, to, for us to accomplish the tasks, an app that is fully functional. General questions on things we talked about today or the class in general? Yeah. When does the JavaScript get executed relative to HTML being interpreted? It's the same sort of thing, top to bottom, left to right. So the web browser started at the very top. It started to do this stuff. It saw, saw, it, saw Java, it saw CSS was in play, so it applied that. It continued to create these HTML nodes. And then it got to JavaScript, and it started to process all of this. So top to bottom, left to right, basically. Any other general questions about the <coughs> class? If it didn't quite work for you, we'll do a little lab time. But any general questions? Yeah. Um, I think just getting, getting, getting in the right path to think about doing all of this because if the code doesn't work, it's often a misspelling. I wrote prompt instead of prompt. So thinking logically and thinking about the syntax, I think that's the hardest part. Knowing the code and memorizing it's not that bad. But the logic of it, I think, is the hard part. And we spent plenty of time trying to debug this stuff. I mistyped the, the code so it doesn't work. And now something else doesn't work. Well, logically, let's stop. When did it last work? Let's look at our code and see and follow down the path of 
where it doesn't work anymore. So I think the testing and the debugging of it is the harder part. All right, so we're going to do some lab time. I'm going to end the lecture at this point. I'm going to put this code into the network folder. I'll remind you where the network folder is in a moment. And then um, you can have some lab time if you need it.